Hebrews chapter 1, and beginning in verse 1. And ladies and gentlemen, this is the Word of God. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, He has spoken to us by His Son, whom He appointed the heir of all things, through whom also He created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of His nature, and He upholds the universe by the word of His power. After making purification for sins, He sat down at the right hand of the Majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name He has inherited is more excellent than theirs. Let's pray. Great God, be exalted. May your truth thunder forth. Give life to the dead, ears to the deaf, eyesight to the blind. May we see you in all your glory. It's a big prayer, but we pray to a big God. May it be so, in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to begin by asking you a question. How much is your faith in Christ worth to you? Is it worth all the trials of this life? It is a good question. Let's go a little further. Is it not only worth the trials of your life, is it worth your death? Really? Really. Is it worth that? Is it worth everything? Is it worth everything and everything and everything and anything that life has to offer? Is your faith in Christ worth more than life itself? Does it really have more value than life? It's clear that those who received this letter, the book of Hebrews as we call it, were faced with these kinds of dilemmas, these very real issues. Following Christ had very real and dramatic consequences. Hebrews is written to address real people faced with real dilemmas. As we look through the book of Hebrews, two themes emerge. One is the message, don't go back. There's nothing to go back to. And second, Christ is better. Better is really the theme of Hebrews. Christ is better. He is better than the prophets. He is better than the angels. He is better than Moses. He's better as a high priest. His priesthood is better than Aaron and sons. He's provided a better sacrifice. His sacrifice was better than all the types and the shadows. From shadow to substance, Christ is better The shadow was the promise of Christ. The substance is, He's come. The shadow is now obsolete. Don't go back. Those things, those sacrifices are no longer needed. Imagine a man who gets on board uh, the internet and goes to a dating website, genuinely looking for a future suitable wife online. He finds what he believes to be a suitable partner and begins communication with her. She checks all the boxes he had in his mind. She's a believer. He's a believer. She's active in her church. He sees her photos and finds her attractive. He prints out the photographs and parades them prominently in his home. She lives in another state, but that's okay. In their discussions, they agree that should things go the right way, should things work out, she would move to be with him and marry. It's not a commitment yet, but it's it's certainly on the table. So the communication continues until at last they realize they've got to meet. They've got to meet. Both are very excited at the thought. She flies from the East Coast to Phoenix, arriving at Sky Harbor Airport, But there's a problem. He doesn't show up to meet her. She can't believe it. Has he been in a car accident? How come he's not there to meet uh, her? How how come with, with racing hearts? 
literally with racing heartbeat, she calls him on the phone to hear these words. Well, honestly, I love our relationship. I, I really do so much that I have many of your photos in my home. Uh, your photos are on my phone. I don't go a day without viewing each and every one of them. And honestly, I just have to say, I'm happy with that. Your photos are all I need. I don't need to see you. I like you. Your photos are kind of everywhere. I see you all the time. She's dumbfounded. In reality, it's clear he does not love her, not in any way at all. He prefers her photo to the reality and rejects the reality, choosing the photos instead of her. Isn't that bizarre? Isn't that a crazy scenario? Yeah, it's totally crazy, totally bizarre. But that's exactly the situation here when Christ has come, the substance has come, and there are people caught up in the types and in the shadows, and that's enough for them. All those types, all those shadows of the old covenant point forward to the one who is coming. He's coming. That's the message. There's one who is the ultimate high priest. They want it. There's one who is the ultimate sacrifice. There's, there's one coming, and he's coming. People reject him in favor of the types and the shadows. Judaism is all about the promise of that one to come. And the message of the New Testament is that he's come. The Messiah has come. And there should be some implication to that, massive implications. And the message of Hebrews is don't go back to that which only promised him, that which only promised his coming. There's no substance there. It's all types. It's all shadows. But there's more. Christ is better in all the ways already mentioned. But the new covenant that Christ has established is better than the old. You've come to a better mountain, Zion, in contrast to Sinai. Everything's better now because Christ is better. That's the message of Hebrews. Hebrews reveals very high Christology, uh, teaching about Christ. He's truly God. He's truly man. We can't get past the first couple of chapters without both of those themes being in full view. He's one person with two natures. Fully God, fully man. Truly God, truly man. Let me say this. If you and I grasp the content of Hebrews, we would never be susceptible to any of the cults, the Christian cults with their false Christs and their false gospels. Understand the message of Hebrews, master its content. You'll never put Jesus on the same level as any other human being. Jesus is unique. As the first four verses directly tell us, God has spoken to us in his Son. He's finally spoken in the ultimate sense. Jesus is unique and Jesus is God's final word. That's the message of the first four verses. I'm not sure how much we'll get to all the first four of the, the verses here. That might be for next time. But I want to just whet your appetite to what we're about to see in the book of Hebrews. God has spoken. He's spoken in long ages past in very different ways, but He's spoken finally now by His Son. That's the message of verse 1. Now, with any book of our Bibles, when we're in Acts, when we're in Ephesians, or John, or Genesis, as we have been, now we turn to Hebrews, we ask this important question. Who wrote Hebrews? Oh, the ink that has been spilled. Uh, writing about that question. The short answer is, are you ready? We don't know. We don't know. There's been a few suggestions, educated guesses through the years. First of all, Paul, uh, the Apostle Paul in church history, men like Jerome, Augustine, and even Thomas Aquinas held to what we call Pauline authorship. They believe Paul wrote the letter to the Hebrews, many others too. I have a King James uh, version of the Bible at my home, and the heading before Hebrews reads this, the epistle of Paul, the apostle to the Hebrews. So there's a lot of tradition to say it was Paul as the author, but over time that 
Pauline authorship has been questioned, in fact, hotly disputed. What we do is, is to go to the book itself, and we don't have the normal rendering of Paul that we have in all his other epistles, where he says, I, Paul, or Paul, an apostle, and he doesn't have that. Uh, we don't have that. But there's internal uh, evidence within the book. Seems to, it seems to take us in a different direction other than Paul. The Protestant reformers largely rejected the idea that it was Paul that was the author. Here's, here's the bottom line. God was the author. God was the author. And for us, we sense and we see the, the, the fingerprints of the Holy Spirit all over the book of Hebrews. But the usual identification and greeting of Paul is, is not there as it is in other letters. I'd like us, if we could, to go to the internal evidence and go to chapter 2 and verse 3. There we have uh, these words, just jumping into the text. How shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? That's a question. It was declared at first by the Lord, and it was attested to us by those who heard. And so it goes on. Isn't that an interesting phrase? Those who heard. I believe, and all scholars I'm, I'm sure would agree, this, this is a reference to the apostles. The apostles were the first to hear the directives of Jesus and hear of the message of Jesus. And therefore we read the next phrase, that message was attested to us. Do you see that? There's those who heard, that's the apostles, and then another group, uh, the, the message was attested to us. So we have to ask the question, who's the us? I think it has to be a group other than the apostles. And that would actually rule out Paul. Paul was an apostle. And Paul received the message of the gospel directly from the Lord. You can read his account in the book of Galatians. He didn't get it from other apostles. So internal evidence seems to take us in a different direction. I'd like us to go to the end of the book because there's, there's something here we need to see. The book of Hebrews goes to 13 chapters. Go to chapter 13. Verse 22. I, that's the writer, and oftentimes when you hear preachers reference Hebrews, they would say this, the writer to the Hebrews, because we're not absolutely sure who wrote the book? I appeal to you, brothers, bear with my word of exhortation, for I've written to you briefly. That's always an encouragement to me. That, that, uh, this, this is, uh, by many theologians' accounts, a, a sermon, one sermon, and uh, there's 13 chapters, and this is just a brief word. <laughs> just a brief word. It takes about 45 minutes or 50 minutes to get through it, and it's just a very brief word. There it is. Bear with my word of exhortation. You should know that our brother Timothy has been released, with whom I shall see you if he comes soon. So obviously the author knows Timothy, counts him as a brother. That's interesting information. Greet all your leaders and all the saints. Those who come from Italy send you greetings. Grace be with you all. So it was someone that knew Timothy, but... There's not the warmth that you would normally see in Paul's heart towards Timothy. He just simply refers to him as our brother Timothy. You'd think he would refer to him as he does elsewhere, my son in the faith, but there's not that. So again, someone who knew Timothy for sure, but was it Paul? I don't know. Another idea put forward by Clement of Alexandria who uh, suggested this around the year 215 AD, that's the third century. His idea was this, that the Apostle Paul wrote Hebrews in Hebrew. And Paul's letter in Hebrew was translated into Greek by Luke. It's an interesting idea. There's actually a good case for this. Luke writes in Koine Greek, but with a high quality of uh, language high caliber Greek in both the Gospels and in the book of Acts. Luke, of course, wrote both the Gospel of Luke and the book of Acts. And this kind of Greek is what we find in Hebrews. Hebrews is written in high quality Greek. However, the book is very, very Jewish in nature. 
and it tends again to take us in another direction. Again, we can't count that idea out, but uh, many scholars go in a different direction. The next candidate, next up to bat, is Barnabas, the companion of Paul. And if you kind of knew Paul, you would get to know Timothy. But Barnabas was put forward by church father by the name of Tertullian, who lived from around AD 155 to 220. He suggested Barnabas as the author to the Hebrews. I'd like us, if we could now, to go to the book of Acts. I uh, was... I have been reading so much along this line. Who wrote? It's like a whodunit. It's, it's like a novel. Who Put the pieces together. And um, it's usually the butler, isn't it? <laughs> Acts chapter 4. Look at this reference to Barnabas. Thus Joseph, who was also called by the apostles Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, a Levite, a native of Cyprus, so it goes on. Notice the information we're given. He is called by the apostles, son of encouragement, Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. And notice these next two words, a Levite. That's significant because the person that wrote the book of Hebrews was very, very familiar with the Levitical system. In fact, you can't really understand Hebrews without some knowledge of the Old Testament, particularly the book of Leviticus. Many of the Christians who start reading their Bibles start in Genesis and they get through it because there's a lot of action. Same with Exodus. But things come to a screeching halt when they get to Leviticus because Unless you're a Levitical priest, you, you, you're just bamboozled and overwhelmed by the intricate details of what the priest should wear, how the sacrifice should be made, and what should be worn at such times, and uh, the, the construction of the tabernacle to the nth degree. And uh, I, I got through Leviticus. Here's how I did it, because it's really a record of if you're a Levitical priest, this is a manual on how to stay alive. That's what it is. But obviously, the writer to the Hebrews was very familiar with the Levitical system. So it's interesting that good old Barney, Barnabas, uh, was a companion of Paul and was a Levite. So, could be him. Scholars actually believe that this sermon, they believe that this book of Hebrews is one sermon based on Psalm 110 verse 11, excuse me, verse 1, which I'm sure you know is the most familiar a verse in the New Testament as a uh, quote from the Old. There's more reference to it than any other verse. The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Uh, we're in Hebrews chapter 13, or we were. Uh, did you remember what we just read? In fact, go there if you, if you can. I appeal to you, brothers, bear with my word of exhortation. I've written to you briefly. Timothy's mention. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll just stay there for a moment we'll be, we'll be back um, Apollos is another one he's uh, in fact for, for many years since I've been reading the Bible my, my little idea in my head was it was Apollos but I can't prove it uh, I don't preach it as doctrine uh, no one really can but here's, here's why There's very little said about him in the New Testament, but what we read is kind of massive. He was a big player when it comes to the New Testament and the early church. And that, again, is something to be understood. He was mightily used by God. If you remember in the early church at Corinth, there were various factions, and Paul had to address that in chapter 1. He says, this is not good. Some say, I'm of Paul, some of... Apollos, some of Cephas, Peter, and some of Christ. There were some who say, I only listen to Jesus, I'm not listening to any man. They were just as much a problem as the others. In fact, what's interesting to me too is that Paul had just as much to say about those who were of Paul. Paul writes and says, it's not good that you're of Paul. Uh, I, I don't want to make people after me. But anyway, one of the big hitters there was Apollos. Um, Keep your finger in in Hebrews and go back 
to the book of Acts. I'd like us to see a, a passage there. Acts chapter 18, where Apollos is mentioned. Read verse uh, 24 with me. And uh, I believe it's very clear that the writer to Hebrews was Jewish himself. It would make no sense if we would declare things other, other than that. And the first words we read in verse 24, Acts 18, verse 24, Now a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus. Notice this. He was an eloquent man, competent in the Scriptures. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in spirit, he spoke and talked accurately the things concerning Jesus, though he knew only the baptism of John. This was early in his conversion. In fact, the conversion story is happening here, and he becomes bold in his uh, teaching. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue, but when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. And when he wished to cross to Achaia, the brothers encouraged him and wrote to the disciples to welcome him. When he arrived, look at this, he greatly helped those who through grace had believed. For he powerfully refuted the Jews in public, showing by the scriptures, what were the scriptures? At this point, the Old Testament scriptures, showing by the scriptures that the Christ, the Messiah, was Jesus. So he was eloquent in the scripture, he was uh, very articulate, he was powerful in his ministry, and he had a thoroughgoing knowledge of the Old Covenant, and was able to prove that Jesus is the Messiah. Martin Luther actually suggested Hebrews was written by Apollos, for what that is worth. Other candidates for the authorship of Hebrews is Clement of Rome, Another one is that there was a team, a husband and wife team of Priscilla and Aquila. We just read of them now. Um, but here's where I go, and it was summed up by Church Father Oregon, um, who lived from 185 to 253 AD. He wrote this. Are you ready? But he who wrote the epistle, truly, only God knows. Here I stand. I can do no other. So if we're not certain about the authorship, knowing it's God who's the divine author, we're not sure who the human author is, we, ask to, we have to ask this question, what was the life situation for those who received the letter? And again, we're in Hebrews chapter 13. Further internal evidence can help us answer this. If you go to verse 24, it says, Greet all your leaders and all the saints... Look at this next phrase. Those who come from Italy send you greetings. You and I might read the book of Hebrews many times and not pick up on that, but uh, something's being communicated there. Those who come from Italy send you greetings. And it would make sense to think that the author is in a certain place. Am I going too fast? He's somewhere. And people from Italy are coming to that place and have come to that place. And through the writer, the writer of Hebrews, these visitors to wherever the author is wish to send greetings back to those still in Italy. They've come from Italy, the author's writing somewhere else, and their heart is... Hey, if you're, if you're writing, send our greetings to those in Italy. Could it be that the writer is writing to, now get this, Hebrew Christians, Jewish believers in Rome? That's definitely logical and could well be the case. And it would make a whole lot of sense. But let's ask this question. Why was it written? And again, internal evidence can help us if we're in chapter 13, go back to chapter 12. Look at verse 4. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. You ever read that? What does it tell us? It tells us that the recipients of the letter were not yet facing martyrdom. They were under persecution. 
And that condition of not suffering or facing martyrdom could really change, and it could change quickly, as it did from emperor to emperor back in those days. Uh, But look in chapter 10, verse 32. But recall the former days when, after you were enlightened, you endured a hard struggle with sufferings. Doesn't seem to be a prosperity and abundant preacher here. Come to Jesus, all your problems are over. No, uh, they came to Christ and the most immediate thing was suffering. Sometimes being publicly exposed to reproach and affliction and sometimes being partners with those so treated. For you had compassion on those in prison. So in other words, some faced prison for their faith. And you joyfully accepted the plundering of your property. They... Their bank accounts perhaps were, li- were, were dismissed and suddenly they lost property. Since you, 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 since you knew that you yourselves had a better possession and an abiding one, talking of their riches in heaven, therefore do not throw away your confidence, which is great reward, for you have need of endurance, so that when you've done the will of God, you may receive what is promised." For yet a little while the coming one will come and will not delay. But my righteous one shall live by faith. And if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who have faith and preserve their souls. Here's what we know. At various times under the Roman Caesars, Christians did face martyrdom. Nero was an especially brutal uh, emperor. Domitian was another one. So Nero was not the only one, but what we do know is Nero blamed Christians for the fire that destroyed much of Rome. And because of that, Christianity became, in that world, a religio illicita. That's Latin for an illegal, illegal religion. That's in contrast to the Jews. Judaism was designated as the opposite of that, a religio licita, a legal religion. Rome really didn't care what you believed and how you practiced your religion as long as you gave the nod to the emperor in worship. But they allowed the Jews to function as a a legal religion. Think about that. Now think this through. If that's the case... The Christians were now described and designated as a religio illicita, an illegal religion. Understand that, and the whole book of Hebrews makes all kinds of sense. Everything fits into place. You see, the Hebrew Christians, the Jews who believe in Jesus, were now sorely tempted to renounce Jesus as the Messiah. Here's why. All they need to do was say, I don't believe Jesus is the Messiah. And they could go back to the synagogue and suffer no persecution whatsoever. It's that easy. Just deny Christ. Just deny Jesus. All they'd have to do was to avoid persecution, deny Jesus is the Messiah, go back to the synagogue, you keep your property, you don't suffer any persecution. And that's why the writer speaks with such passion. There's nothing to go back to. Christ is better. You go away from Him. You reject Him. There's no other message. And that's the message of the opening words. And it's the message right through the entire epistle. Jesus is God's final word. God has spoken in and by and through His Son. He's provided the final sacrifice. He's the ultimate priest. He's brought in the new covenant. And I believe what I've described to you makes sense of the whole book. It's why the writer writes as he does. He writes with strong encouragements to press on, to keep going. And it explains the severe warnings. Hebrews, more than any other place in the New Testament, has Passages that contain severe warnings. Hebrews chapter 6, Hebrews chapter 10. In fact, let's go there. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19, jumping into the passage with the word therefore. And whenever you see a therefore, always ask, what is it therefore? 
It's on the basis of all that's come before it. But we're just going to jump into the passage. Hopefully, you'll see we're not taking it out of context at all. Verse 19, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that He opened for us through the curtain, that is, through His flesh, And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day drawing near, the day of Christ's second coming. Look at verse 26. For if we go on sinning deliberately, I would suggest to you that the sinning here refers to walking away from the faith by denying Jesus. That's an ultimate kind of sin. If we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth. The truth of what? That Jesus is the promised Messiah. There no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. Why? Jesus is the ultimate sacrifice for sins. Reject Him. There's nothing to go back to. Early in my Christian experience, the church I was at taught us a song. The words are like this. Oh, there's nothing to go back to. Oh, praise God, have heaven in view. I'm too near my heavenly home to turn back now. I tell Satan, get thee behind. No turning back in me you'll find. I'm too near my heavenly home to turn back now. That really is the message. If we go on sinning, denying Christ, if we deliberately deny Him after understanding who He is, There no longer remains a sacrifice for sin, but a fearful expectation of judgment and a fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. Anyone who has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the evidence of two or three witnesses. How much worse punishment do you think will be deserved by the one who has trampled underfoot the Son of God? See, well, that's the sin. A lot of people go through this passage and say, have I, I've, sinned, I've sinned deliberately. I, I, I know I shouldn't have done something. I did it deliberately. Have I lost my salvation? Not at all. This is speaking about trampling underfoot the Son of God. That's what your rejection of Jesus is. And has profaned the blood of the covenant by which He was sanctified. In a later message, Lord willing, I'll talk about how the the word he there refers, I believe, to Christ. There's many other scholars who would say that. By which he was set apart. Christ set himself apart for the sacrifice. And has outraged the spirit of grace. For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. You see, once we understand the life situation, that kind of a passage makes total sense. Don't go back. Don't go back to the synagogue. Don't go back to Judaism. You've come to a knowledge of Christ. In any sermon, the preacher preaches to the saved and to the unsaved, to the visible church and the invisible church. The invisible church are those that are known to Christ. Invisible to us, we don't know who the elect are. But God does. He's never fooled, even if man is fooled. And so there's a mixed congregation. Jesus preached to a mixed congregation, believers and unbelievers. And that's always the case. And when a sermon goes out, there's a strong warning. And that's what we find here. Renounce Christ. There's nothing to go back to. And the warnings come in the context of the visible church where both those who are saved and unsaved are present in the service hearing the reading of this. There's wheat and tares. There's sheep and goats. And those warnings, these warnings, serve two purposes. For the elect, they hear His voice through His word and take heed to them. The non-elect, the goats, they they do not hear His voice. They ignore the warnings and fall away. Pastor, walk me through that. Let let, let me see if I can help you. Because we read these passages and we think, does this teach the loss of salvation? Uh, No. Uh, I don't believe those who are truly saved lose salvation. Because Jesus, as the true shepherd and the good shepherd, doesn't lose any sheep. 
You'd have to think about that. A sheep then becomes a goat. Think of the implications of that. Once, were, once they were a sheep, but now they've turned into a goat. No. Do you know the sheep have always been sheep? They were chosen to be sheep before the foundation of the world. So let's walk this through. If the elect will be saved without any doubt, people ask this question, why would there be any need of warnings? That doesn't make any sense. Well, pause, think about that. Actually, it makes perfect sense. First of all, I'd like to change the question from if the elect will be saved without any doubt to since the elect will be saved without any doubt. Since the elect will be saved without any doubt, Jesus actually said it, John 6, 34, all that the Father gives me will come to me. They still have to come, but Jesus tells us why they come, because they're a gift from the Father to the Son. Why would there be a need of warnings? Well, let me give you an example, an illustration. Let's say a father has children. And let's say that those children will survive childhood Say he has four children and all of them will reach adulthood. One of the things he will do at various different times in the life of each child is to have a conversation whereby he stresses the need to never run into the street without looking. In fact, look both ways. Both ways. Why? Because there are cars out there. You may not hear the cars, but they're there. And be aware, you could die if you run out into the street. Say you're playing soccer or you're playing uh, baseball or whatever the sport may be and the ball goes out into the street. Don't just run out and get it. The father sits down with the kids and, or maybe stands with them and says, don't ever, 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 ever. In fact, never, 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 never run out into the street without looking. You'll die if you do. Here's the thing. Though living through childhood into adulthood for those kids is decreed by God, one of the means God uses to get them through to adulthood is the means of the warning. Don't go out onto the street without looking. I believe is what's taking place here in the book of Hebrews. There's severe warnings. Severe warnings. But the question is this, who will heed those warnings? Answer, the elect will. And God uses the means of the warnings to keep his elect close to himself. Who won't listen? The non-elect. They won't pay, pay heed to the warnings. Let's go back to Hebrews chapter 1. That's my introduction. Let's look now <laughs> at verse 1. Oh, help him, Jesus. Amen. Long ago, and many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. Various different ways and means. God actually spoke in different ways. But in these last days... He has spoken to us by His Son. In an ultimate sense, He's spoken to us by His Son, whom He appointed the heir of all things, through whom also He created the world. It starts with the recognition that He's about to inherit everything. He's heir of all things, even though He's the creator of all things. That's massive. He created all things. He inherits all things. He's the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of His nature and He upholds the universe by the word of His power. After making purification for sins, He sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name He has inherited is more excellent than theirs. I'll just make this comment. These four verses in our English Bibles are one sentence in the original Greek of the New Testament. And the message is this. The 30,000 feet message is Jesus is God's final word. Reject him. And there's no other message to hear. God has nothing more to say to you. I don't want Jesus. Is, is there anything else? There's silence now. God's got nothing else to say. 
And the message of Hebrews is Christ is better. Better than anyone else he's done. Better than anyone else he's provided. Better than anyone else. And what we have is the contrast of the inferior to the superior. Christ is better than the prophets. He's better than the angels. He's better than Moses. Christ is a better high priest. His priesthood is better than that of Aaron and sons. The Leviticus, the Levitical priesthood is inferior to the superior of the priesthood of Melchizedek. There's a whole chapter on that in the book of Hebrews. The old covenant is inferior to the better thing, the new covenant. The tabernacle of Moses is inferior to the heavenly tabernacle. That's superior. The Levitical sacrifices are inferior to the superior sacrifice of Jesus. Jesus has provided a better sacrifice. Under the old covenant system, priests continually offered every year on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, the high priest went into the holy place, the Holy of Holies, and offered sacrifice. But his work was never done. And certainly there was no place in the tabernacle for the high priest to sit. But in contrast, we're told when Jesus made one sacrifice, not 84, not 312, not year after year, one sacrifice for sin, he sat down. It was done forever. Nothing more to be done. He had done it all. Christ has provided a better sacrifice. His sacrifice is better than the types and shadows. Don't go back to the photos. The reality, the substance is here. You've come to a better mountain. Sinai is inferior to Zion. That is superior. And Hebrews 12 tells us that's where you've come. Everything's better now because Christ is better. Think about this. A church under persecution. Jewish Christians gathering and where there may have been hundreds, now only tens are coming. And it doesn't look that much. It doesn't look when huddled together in some underground ceremony. Christians are meeting and there's 20 people and it used to be a whole lot more. And is this it? And the author of Hebrews tells us, if you could only see what is real in the spiritual realm, do you understand? You've not just come to Sinai, which is a foreboding place where even if you touch the mountain, you die. You've come to Zion, to the city of the living God. You've come to angels resplendent in festal array. Innumerable companies of angels. Look at the service from God's perspective. There's not just eight there. There's not just 20 there. There's a, there's a sum so vast. Man cannot even calculate how many is present. And that's where you come. It doesn't look good on the outside. It doesn't look good to earthly eyes. But we walk by faith and not by sight. And that's why we've got Hebrews 11. By faith they did this. By faith they did this. Moses endured as seeing him who is invisible. You've got to look beyond the earthly and see what you have is better than life in the synagogue. It's better than those old sacrifices. It's better. It's better. It's better. Don't go back. But press on. Press on. Press on. The writer's in the trenches with them. He doesn't speak of you so much as us. Don't go back. Press on. In fact, Hebrews gives us 12 lettuce passages. I wrote them down this morning because I thought this would really sum up the heart. Perhaps it is Barnabas, but perhaps it's, we know it's someone. Someone wrote this and they were coming along, alongside. Not you should do this, but we should do this. Let us. Chapter 4, verse 1, let us fear. Chapter 4, verse 11, let us be diligent. Chapter 4, verse 14, let us hold fast our confession. Chapter 4, verse 16, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace. Chapter 6, verse 1, let us press on to maturity. Chapter 10, verse 22, let us draw near into the Holy of Holies. Chapter 10, verse 23, let us hold fast the confession of our hope. Chapter 10, verse 24, let us consider how to stimulate one another. Chapter 12, verse 1, let us run with endurance. Chapter 12, verse 28, 
Let us show gratitude. Chapter 13, verse 13, let us go out to him. Chapter 13, verse 15, let us offer a sacrifice of praise. This sermon, this exhortation, this brief word is a strong call. And that's what an exhortation is. It's a, it's a strong call to action. Why should you be interested in the book of Hebrews? Why should you come back as we go verse by verse through this amazing Amazing book. I'd say this, Master Hebrews, and you'll never be attracted by the doctrine of the cults. You'll never be tempted to follow a lesser Jesus. The Jesus of the Bible is true God, true man. Master Hebrews, and you'll know a lot more about your Bible. You'll know your Bible better, and you will rest in the finished work of the perfect Savior. In the Gospels, Jesus cried out, John chapter 19, It is finished. Tetelestai in Greek, one word, three words in English, it is finished. And it means it's paid for, it's done, it's complete, I've done it all. Nothing more to be added. That's the statement, that's the declaration of Jesus on the cross. And the writer of Hebrews spells it out. This is why it's better. This is why it was all done. That's why there's no need to go back. There's a new sacrifice, the one sacrifice that doesn't need to be repeated. It's done. It's done forever for those he died for. Understand Hebrews and you'll know the gospel inside out. It really spells it out. R.C. Sproul was once asked a question if you were sent to prison at some or some island and you were only allowed one book, what book, of the, what book would you take with you? And he said, well, obviously the Bible. And if they uh, then said, well, you can only have one book of the Bible, what book would you take? And he said, well, many would think it would be Romans, but he says, I've taught uh, Romans so, so often throughout my life, I can just about recite the whole thing. I would take the book of Hebrews. There's nothing like this book in our Bible. We have some knowledge of Jesus as high priest in other parts, but this is unique. It really spells out the high priest ministry of Jesus and his present day ministry as high priest. Hebrews 7, 25, he ever lives to make intercession for us. Why do you hope that your faith will not fail? Because he holds me fast. He's praying for me. See him as the high priest in his present day ministry of intercession right now at the Father's right hand. You need Hebrews for that. I hope I've whetted your appetite for what God willing will be a most amazing journey. And it will bring us face to face with Christ and his gospel. What makes you tick, John? I want to know Christ. I want to know his gospel. And I want to proclaim Christ and I want to proclaim his gospel. gospel. He Hebrews will tell much, us much about this. What is that gospel? God, the second person of the Trinity, the one we know as the Lord Jesus Christ, became a man. Hebrews makes it clear. He, he shared with flesh and blood. He, he does not help angels. And that's the amazing thing. He didn't become an angel to save angels. He became a man to save the sons of men. The Son of God became the Son of Man that the sons of men might become the sons of God. This Jesus was born of a virgin and lived a sinless life and died an atoning death on the cross. And he really did atone for sin. And three days later, he rose again from the dead. God's vindication that all that he was and all that he said was true. And right now he's at the place of all authority in this universe so that anyone who calls on his name and repents of their sin, they've committed high treason against God, all of us. But God has laid on Jesus the sin of all those who would ever believe. And he bore our sins in his body on the tree. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the gospel. I hope I've whetted your appetite for what is ahead through this series. May God do wondrous things among us.
through the preaching of his word, will see Christ. Not by means of a vision, not because you go up on some mountain, have some experience, but you find him in and through and by his word. And in his word, because God has revealed himself through his word, as the first verse of Hebrews proclaims, God has now spoken in and through and by his son. And there's no other message. Reject this one, there's no hope. My plea to you is that you would come to know him if you have not already. In repentance and faith, come to this one who now stands ready to forgive you. Reject him and there's not another message. It's not as if God said, oh, you rejected him, let let me see what else I can do. What other message will be more suitable? No, this is the final word. Jesus, what will you do with him? And once you understand that, never, ever, ever, Never, ever, ever go back. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this amazing book. As we delve more into it in the weeks to come, would you write these truths on human hearts, all of our hearts, that we may know you truly, and in this you be glorified. And may we spread the knowledge of Christ wherever we go. May we know him and make him known. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.